You can listen to Q&A and all of our podcasts on our new free C-SPAN Now app. With the 1973 Roe v. Wade case and abortion being widely debated and discussed in the nation today, American History TV is looking back to see what the nine justices who are currently on the Supreme Court had to say about Roe v. Wade in their confirmation hearings. We begin with Justice Samuel Alito, the author of the new leaked draft opinion which seeks to overturn the Roe case. His nomination hearing was held in January 2006. You conceded the fact that we have free speech because it's explicit in our Constitution, protected constitutional right. And yet, when Senator Schumer asked you repeatedly, do you find that Roe versus Wade established and recognized a constitutional protection for a woman to make this most private decision, you wouldn't answer. You wouldn't give a direct answer. On two Supreme Court cases, Griswold and Brown now, you have said, just right as we started this hearing, that you believe there is a constitutional basis for this protection and for this right. And yet, when it came to Roe versus Wade, you would not. Most of us are troubled by this 1985 memo. You said yesterday you would have an open mind when it came to this issue. I'm sorry to report that your memo seeking a job in the Reagan administration does not evidence an open mind. It evidences a mind that sadly is closed in some areas. Yesterday when you were asked about uh, one man, one vote, you clarified it, said those were my views then, they're not my views now. When Senator Cole asked you about the, the power and authority of elected uh, branches as opposed to others, no, he said I want to clarify that's not my view now. And yet, when we have tried to press you on this, this critical statement that you made in that application, a statement which was made by you that said the Constitution does not protect a right to an abortion, you've been unwilling to distance yourself and to say that you disagree with that. I think this is critically important because as far as I am concerned, Judge Alito, we have to rely on the Supreme Court to protect our rights and freedoms, especially our right to privacy. And for you to say that you're for Griswold, you accept the constitutional basis for Griswold, but you can't bring yourself to say there's a constitutional basis for the right of a woman's privacy when she is deciding, making a tragic, painful decision about continuing a pregnancy that may risk her health or her life. I'm troubled by that. Why, why can you say unequivocally that you find constitutional support for Griswold? Unequivocally, you find constitutional support for Brown but cannot bring yourself to say that you find constitutional support for a woman's right to choose. Brown versus Board of Education, as you pointed out, is based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment, of course, was adopted and ratified after the Civil War. It talks about equality. It talks about equal protection of the law. And uh, the principle that was finally recognized in Brown versus Board of Education after nearly a century of misapplication of the 14th Amendment is that denying people the opportunity, people of, of a particular race, the opportunity to attend schools or for that matter to make use of other public facilities that are open to people uh, of a different race denies them equality. They're not treated the same way. Uh, an African-American is not treated the same way as a black person when they're treated that way. So they're denied equality. And that is based squarely on the language of the Equal Protection Clause and the principle, the, 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 hard, the principle that was uh, the, the, the magnificent principle that emerged from this great struggle that is embodied in the Equal Protection Clause. Griswold uh, concerned the marital right to privacy. And when the decision was handed down, uh, it was written by Justice Douglas. And he based that on his theories of, uh, his theory of emanations and penumbras from various constitutional provisions, the Ninth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment, and a variety of others. But it has been understood in later cases as based on the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which uh, says that no person shall be denied due process, uh, shall be denied liberty without due process of law. 
And that's my understanding of it. And the issue that was involved in Griswold, uh, the, the possession of contraceptives by married people, is not an issue that is likely to come before the courts again. Uh, it's not likely to come before the Third Circuit. It's not likely to come before the Supreme Court. So I feel uh, an ability to comment, a greater ability to comment on that than I do on an issue that is involved in litigation. Now, what I have said about Roe is that if it were, if the issue were to come before me, if I'm confirmed and I'm on the Supreme Court and the issue comes up, uh, the, first the first step in the analysis for me would be the issue of stare decisis, and that would be very important. The things that I said in the 1985 memo were a true expression of my views at the time from my vantage point as an attorney in the Solicitor General's office, but that was 20 years ago, and a great deal has happened in the case law since then. Uh, Thornburg was decided, and then uh, Webster, and then Casey, and a number of other decisions. So the stare decisis analysis would have to take account of that entire line of case law. And then if I got beyond that, I would approach the question, and of course in Casey, that was the beginning and the ending point of the analysis and the joint opinion. If I were to get beyond that, I would approach that question the way I approach every legal issue that I approach as a judge, and that is to approach it with an open mind and to go through the whole judicial process, which is designed, and I believe strongly in it, to achieve good results, to achieve good decision making. Well, and this is what troubles me, that you do not see Roe as a natural extension of Griswold, that you do not see the privacy rights of Griswold extended by the decision in Roe, that you decided to create categories of cases that are uh, have been decided by the court, that you will concede have constitutional protection, but you have left in question the future of Roe versus Wade. Yesterday, Senator Specter uh, asked you, as he asked uh, John Roberts before you, a, a series of questions about whether or not you accept the concept that this is somehow a, a, uh, a precedent uh, that we can rely on, that is embedded in our experience, that if it were changed, it would call into question the legitimacy of the court. And time and time again, he brought you to the edge, hoping that you would agree, and rarely, if ever, did you acknowledge that you would agree. You made in the most general statement that you believed reliance was part of stare decisis. But let me just ask you this. John Roberts said that Roe versus Wade is the settled law of the land. Do you believe it is the settled law of the land? Roe versus Wade is a, an important precedent of the Supreme Court. It was decided in 1973, so it's been on the books for a long time. It has been challenged on a number of occasions and I discussed those yesterday, and it is my, and the Supreme Court has reaffirmed the decision, sometimes on the merits, sometimes in Casey, based on stare decisis. And I think that when a decision is challenged and it is reaffirmed, that strengthens its value as stare decisis for at least two reasons. First of all, the more often a decision is reaffirmed, the more people tend to rely on it. And secondly, I think stare decisis reflects the view that there is wisdom embedded in decisions that have been made by prior justices who take the same oath and are scholars and are conscientious. And when they examine a question and they reach a conclusion, I think that's entitled to considerable respect. And of course, the more times that happens, the more respect the decision is, is entitled to. And that's my, that's my view of that. So, uh, it is an, it's a very important precedent. That is it is the settled law of the land? Uh, it, it, it is a precedent. Uh, uh, if settled means that it, is, it can't be re-examined, uh, then that's one thing. If settled means that it is a, it is a precedent that is entitled to respect to stare decisis, uh, and all of the factors that I've mentioned come into play, including the, the reaffirmation and all of that, then uh, it, it is, a, it is a, a precedent that is... Uh, protected, entitled to respect under the doctrine of stare decisis in that way. How do you see it? Uh, I've explained, Senator, as best I can how I see it. It is a, a precedent that has now been uh, on the books for several decades. It has been challenged. It has been 
reaffirmed. Uh, but it is an issue that is involved in litigation now at, at all levels. There is an abortion case before the Supreme Court this term. There are abortion cases in the lower courts. I've sat on three of them on the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. I'm sure there are others in uh, other courts of appeals uh, or working their way toward the courts of appeals right now. So it's, a, it's a, a, an issue that is involved in a considerable amount of litigation that is going on. I would say, Judge Alito, that it is a painful issue for most of us. Uh, it is a difficult issue for most of us. The act of abortion itself is many times a hard decision, a sad decision, a tragic decision. Uh, I believe that for 30 years we have tried to strike a balance in this country to say it is a legal procedure, but it should be discouraged. It should be legal but rare and try to find ways to reduce the incidence of abortion. But as I listen to the way that you've answered this question this morning and yesterday and the, the fact that you have refused to refute that, that statement in the 1985 job application, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that uh, many people will leave this hearing with a question as to whether or not you could be the deciding vote that would eliminate the legality of abortion. That was Associate Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito in 2006. Appointed by President George W. Bush, Justice Alito is the author of the leaked opinion draft which seeks to overturn the Roe v. Wade decision. Retiring Justice Stephen Breyer was nominated by President Clinton in 1994 and confirmed that same year. He, too, was asked about the Roe v. Wade case and how he would rule if a similar case came before the high court. Basically, I think that word liberty in the 14th Amendment has been recognized by most, almost all, modern judges on the Supreme Court, and it's pretty widely accepted that that word liberty includes a number of basic important things that are not those only listed in the first eight amendments to the Constitution. And the Ninth Amendment helps make that very clear, because it says, don't use that fact of the first eight the reason to the conclusion that there are no others. So it isn't surprising to me that there is widespread recognition that that word liberty does encompass something on the order of privacy. People have described those basic rights not mentioned in words like concept of ordered liberty, that which the traditions of our people realize or recognize as fundamental. And in looking to try to decide what is the content of that, I think judges have started with text. And after all, in amendments to the Constitution, there are words that suggest that in different contexts, privacy was important. They go back to the history. They look at what the framers intended. They look at traditions over time. They look at how those traditions have worked out as history has changed. And they're careful. They're careful. Because eventually, 20 or 30 years from now, other people will look back at the interpretations that this generation writes, if they're judges, and they'll say, were they right to say that that ought permanently to have been the law? If the answer to that question is yes, then the judges of today were right in finding that that was a basic value that the framers of the Constitution intended to have enshrined. That's a kind of test of objectivity. Mm -hmm. But the source, I think, is the 14th Amendment and that word liberty. Mm -hmm. Uh, the notion of liberty uh, arises, obviously, in a number of different areas, and I, I think there's been some examination here uh, on this committee, but I, I just would like for my own edification uh, to really get a specific response from you. And uh, this goes to the issue of a woman's right to choose. 
just, Justice uh, uh, Ginsburg a year ago said that she believed that, the, that a woman's right was part of the essential dignity of the individual. And of course, the notion of privacy has also been referred to as the right to be left alone. And I guess my specific question is whether you would believe that a woman's right to be left alone means the right to be left alone with regard to as an intimate decision as whether or not to be pregnant. That is the determination of Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade is the law of this country, at least for more than 20 years that there is some kind of basic right of the nature that you describe. Recently, the Supreme Court has reaffirmed that right in Casey versus Planned Parenthood. And so in my opinion, that is settled law. And that was retiring Justice Stephen Breyer at his 1994 confirmation hearing discussing the legalities of abortion. Amy Coney Barrett is the newest justice currently on the court. She was nominated by President Trump in 2020 and confirmed on a close vote. A former law professor at Notre Dame, her religion and past writings were scrutinized in her nomination hearing. Here she is discussing the court and abortion. I think on that question, I, you know, I'm going to invoke Justice Kagan's description, which I think is um, perfectly put. When she was in her confirmation hearing, she said, that she was not going to grade precedent or give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And I think in an area where precedent continues to be pressed and litigated, as is true of Casey, it would be particularly, um, it would actually be wrong and a violation of the canons for me to do that as a sitting judge. Um, so if, if I express a view on a precedent one way or another, whether I say I love it or I hate it, it signals to litigants that I might tilt one way or another in a pending case. So on something that is really a major cause with major effect on over half of the population of this country who are women, after all. It's, it's distressing not to get a straight answer. So let me try again. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? <clears throat> Senator, I completely understand why you are asking the question. But again, I can't pre-commit or say, yes, I'm going in with some agenda, because I'm not. I don't have any agenda. I have no agenda to try to overrule Casey. Um, I have an agenda to stick to the rule of law and decide cases as they come. Well, what I'm, as a person, uh, I don't know if you'll answer this one either. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe can and should be overturned by the Supreme Court? Well, I think my answer is the same because, you know, that's a case that's litigated. It could, you know, its contours could come up again. In fact, do come up. You know, they, they came up last term before the court. So I think, you know, what the Casey standard is and um, that's just it's a contentious issue, which is, I know, one reason why it would be comforting to you to have an answer. But I can't express views on cases or pre-commit um, to approaching a case any particular way? Well, that makes it difficult for me. And I think for other women also on this committee, because this is a very important case and it affects a lot of people, millions and millions of women. And you could be a very important vote. And I had hoped you would say, as a person, uh, you've got a lovely family. You understand all the implications of family life. Um, you should be very proud of that. I'm proud of you for that. Um, but my position is a little different. You're going on the biggest court of this land with a problem out there that all women see one way or another in their life. And <clears throat> not all, but yeah, certainly married women do and others too. And so the question comes, um, what happens? And will this justice uh, support a law that has substantial precedent now? Would you commit yourself on whether you would or would not? Senator, what I will commit is that I will obey all the rules of stare decisis, that if a question comes up 
before me about whether Casey or any other case should be overruled, that I will follow the law of stare decisis, applying it as the court has articulated it, applying all the factors, reliance, workability, um, being undermined by later facts and law, just all the standard factors. And I promise to do that for any issue that comes up, abortion or anything else, I'll follow the law. You're watching American History TV on C-SPAN as we look back at what the current justices said about Roe v. Wade during their confirmation hearings. Justice Neil Gorsuch was asked about the 1973 decision as well. Senator, again, I would tell you that Roe v. Wade, decided in 1973, is a precedent of the United States Supreme Court. It has been reaffirmed. The reliance interest considerations are important there. And all of the other factors that go into analyzing precedent have to be considered. It is a precedent of the United States Supreme Court. It was reaffirmed in Casey in 1992 and in several other cases. So a good judge will consider it as precedent of the United States Supreme Court worthy as treatment of precedent like any other. What about Griswold, which was decided a few years before Roe, the case where the court found constitutional right to privacy? Can you tell me your views on Griswold? Senator, it's a precedent that's now 50 years old. Griswold involved the right of married couples to use contraceptive devices in the privacy of their own home. Um, and uh, it's 50 years old. The reliance interests are obvious. It's been repeatedly reaffirmed. All very important factors, again, in analyzing precedent. Well, I think I'm going to uh, stop questioning, but I'd kind of sum up what you and I just talked about in regard to precedent uh, so everybody understands the principles that are at stake here. There are two reasons why you can't give your opinion on these cases. One, I believe, is independence. And the other one's fairness to future litigants. Uh, is that the way you see it? It is, Senator. Um, if I were to start telling you which are my favorite precedents or which are my least favorite precedents, or if I viewed precedent in that fashion, I would be tipping my hand and suggesting to litigants that I've already made up my mind about their cases. That's not a fair judge. I didn't want that kind of judge when I was a lawyer, and I don't want to be that kind of judge now. And I made a vow to myself I wouldn't be. That's the fairness problem. And then the independence problem. If it looks like I'm giving hints or previews or intimations about how I might rule, I, I think that's the beginning of the end of the independent judiciary. If, if judges have to make effectively campaign promises for confirmation. And respectfully, Senator, I haven't done that in this process, and I'm not about to start. Thank you. I'll yield back eight seconds. Senator Feinstein. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, welcome, Judge, and good morning. Good morning, good to Senator. See you again. Since we're on row, I wasn't going to begin with this, but I well recall the time we spent in my office, and we talked about precedent, and in my opening remarks, I indicated that if anything had super precedent, uh, Roe did in terms of the numbers, and I've put that uh, in the record. Here's why it becomes of concern. Uh, the president said that he would appoint someone who would overturn Roe. Uh, you pointed out to me that um, you viewed precedent in a serious way <clears throat> in that it added stability to the law. Could you elaborate on the point that you made in my office on that? I'd be delighted to, Senator. Um, part of the value of precedent, it has lots of value. It has value in and of itself because it's our history. And our history has value intrinsically. But it also has an instrumental value in this sense. It adds to the determinacy of law. We have lots of tools that allow us to narrow the realm of admissible dispute between parties so that we can, people can anticipate and organize their affairs. It's part of the reason why the rule of law in this country works so well. We have statutes, we have rules, we have a fact-finding process and a judicial 
system that's the envy of the world. And precedent is a key part of that because, as the chairman pointed out when he quoted a, a piece of mine, once a case is settled, that adds to the determinacy of the law. What, became, what was once a hotly contested issue is no longer a hotly contested issue. We move forward. And, and Senator, the value of that is the United States Supreme Court takes something like 70 or 80 cases a year. That is a tiny fraction of all the disputes in our federal legal system, right? right. My, my law clerks tell me it's something like 0.001%. And they're unanimous in those cases which have divided circuit judges. That's why Supreme Court largely takes the case, because it's divided us. It's one of the rare cases where we disagree. They're unanimous 40% of the time. One other question. Sure. Do you view Roe as having super precedent? Well, Senator, I, 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 a super precedent is a-, a In numbers, uh, 44. It, it has been reaffirmed many times. Justice Neil Gorsuch is one of three justices nominated by President Trump and confirmed to serve on the Supreme Court. He began his tenure in 2017 in light of the leaked opinion on overturning the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, American History TV is looking back at what the current members of the High Court had to say about abortion during their confirmation hearings. Justice Elena Kagan began serving on the court in 2010. The former Harvard Law School dean was nominated by President Obama. She, too, was asked about the issue at her confirmation hearing. Um, as I understand the law after Casey, it's that... Uh, after bot viability, mm -hmm. the state can uh, regulate as it pleases, except for um, uh, right. situations where the woman's life or health interests are at issue. Before viability, the question is whether there is an undue burden right. on the uh, uh, right. woman's ability to have an abortion. Is it fair for the court to consider scientific changes and when a fetus becomes viable as medical science evolves? Senator Graham, I, I do think that in every area that it is fair to consider scientific changes. We've, I've, I've talked in the past about how different forms of technology influence the evolution of the court's Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because just as it would have been wrong to not consider the changes of how society had evolved versus segregation of young children based on race, I hope the court would consider the modern concept of viability in the 21st century and whatever protection you could give the unborn uh, would be much appreciated on my part by considering science, not your personal feelings, because I think it's appropriate for the court to do so. Let me, I don't think we need to do this, but let me uh, just um, go over your 2009 confirmation hearings when you were asked about the partial birth abortion decision. You repeatedly stated that you would respect Gonzalez versus Carhart, in which the court rejected a facial challenge to the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act based on stare decisis. Uh, that's what you said in the last hearing. I, I assume that's your position today. Uh, absolutely, Senator Carhart, that, uh, that the Gonzalez case is, is settled law, entitled to all the precedent of settled law going forward. And I just really want to make a personal comment, as I did on my opening statement. Many of us believe Roe v. Wade is a matter of privacy and a woman's right of choice and is not really taking sides on abortion. Not whether you favor or oppose abortions, whether you favor a woman's right of choice and the right of privacy and what is the appropriate role for the, the government to play. Elena Kagan has served on the Supreme Court since 2010. The next justice we'll be listening to is Brett Kavanaugh. His contentious 2018 nomination hearings included questions about Roe v. Wade. Here's a portion. Well, as a general proposition, I understand the importance of the precedent set forth in Roe v. Wade. So Roe v. Wade held, of course, and it's reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that a woman has a constitutional right to obtain an abortion before viability, subject to reasonable regulation by the state, 
up to the point where that regulation constitutes an undue burden on the woman's right to obtain an abortion. And one of the reasons for that holding, as explained by the court in Roe and uh, also in Planned Parenthood versus Casey more fully, is along the lines of what you said, Senator Feinstein, about uh, the quote from Justice O'Connor. So that's one of the rationales that undergirds Roe v. Wade. It's one of the rationales that undergirds Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Well, let me give you another one rationale. <clears throat> In the 1950s and 60s, the two decades before Roe, deaths from illegal abortions in this country ran between 200,000 and 1.2 million. That's according to the Guttmacher Institute. So a lot of women died in that period. So the question comes, and you have said today, uh, not today, but in, it, it's been reported that you have said that Roe is now settled law. The first question I have of you is what do you mean by settled law? I tried to ask earlier, do you believe it is correct law? Um, have your views on whether Roe is settled precedent or could be overturned? And, and has your views changed since you were in the Bush White House? Senator, I um, said that it's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years, as you know. And uh, most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. And as you well recall, Senator, I know uh, when that case came up, the Supreme Court didn't just reaffirm it uh, in passing, the court specifically went through all the factors of stare decisis in considering whether to overrule it. And the joint opinion of Justice Kennedy, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Souter at great length went through that, those factors. That was the question presented in the case. Could I interrupt you to say, since you mentioned stare decisis, and I sat on nine of these hearings, and when the subject comes up, the person says, I will follow stare decisis. And they get confirmed, and then, of course, they don't. So I think knowing going into it um, how you make a judgment on these issues is really important to our vote as whether to support you or not. Because I don't want to go back to those death totals in this country. And I truly believe that women should be able to control their own reproductive systems within, obviously, um, some concern for a viable uh, fetus. Mm -hmm. And I understand your point of view on that, Senator, and I understand how passionate and how deeply people feel about this issue. I understand the importance of the issue. Uh, I understand the, the importance that people attach to the Roe v. Wade decision, to the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision. Uh, I don't live in a bubble. I understand, I live in the real world. I understand the importance of the issue. Well, my and, staff just passed me a note. Let me read it to you because I think it's a good, have your views about whether Roe is settled precedent changed since you were in the Bush White House? My, um, yes or no? Well, I'll tell you what my okay. views, uh, I'm not sure what it's referring to about Bush White House, but I will uh, tell you what my view right now is, which is this important precedent of the Supreme Court that's been reaffirmed many times, but then plan, and this is the point I want to make that I think is important, Planned Parenthood versus Casey reaffirmed Roe and did so by considering the starry decisis factors. So Casey now becomes a precedent on precedent. It's not as if it's just a run-of-the-mill case that was decided and never been reconsidered, but Casey specifically reconsidered it, applied the stare decisis factors, and decided to reaffirm it. That makes Casey a precedent on precedent. 
Another example of that, as you might say, are there other cases like that, is Miranda. So Miranda's reaffirmed a lot, but then in the Dickerson case in 2000, Chief Justice Rehnquist writes the opinion, considering the stare decisis factors and reaffirming Miranda. Even though Chief Justice Rehnquist, by the way, had been a fervent critic of Miranda throughout his career, he decided that it had been settled too long, had been precedent too long, and he reaffirmed it. So what? precedent on, pre I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Thank you. But I want to switch subjects and one last question. What would you say your position today is on a woman's right to choose? Well, as a judge. As a judge. As a judge, it is an important precedent of the Supreme Court. By it, I mean Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Been reaffirmed many times. Casey is precedent on precedent which itself is an important factor to remember. And I understand the significance of the issue, the jurisprudential issue, and I understand the significance as best I can, I always try and I do here, of the real world effects of that decision as I try to do of all the decisions of my court and of the Supreme Court. And you're watching American History TV on C-SPAN as we look back to see what the current Supreme Court justices had to say about abortion and the law during their confirmation hearings. Chief Justice John Roberts has served on the court since 2005. The George W. Bush nominee had this to say when asked about the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. Well, Senator, the importance of settled expectations in the application of stare decisis is a very important consideration. That was emphasized in the Casey opinion, uh, but also in other opinions outside uh, that area of the law. Uh, the principles of stare decisis look at a number of factors, settled expectations, one of them, in, as you mentioned, um, whether or not particular precedents have proven to be unworkable is, is another consideration on the other side. Uh, whether the doctrinal bases of a decision have been eroded by subsequent developments. For example, if you have a case uh, in which there are three precedents that lead and support that result, and in the intervening period, two of them have been overruled, uh, that may be a basis for reconsidering the, the prior precedent. But there's no, there's no doc, doctrinal basis erosion in Roe, is there, uh, well, Roberts? I, I, I feel the need to stay away from a discussion of particular cases. I'm happy to discuss the principles of stare decisis. And the court has developed a series of precedents on precedent, if you will. They have a number of cases talking about how this principle should be applied. And as you emphasized in Casey, they focused on settled expectations. They also looked at the workability and the uh, uh, erosion of precedents. The erosion of precedent, I think, figured more prominently in the in the court's discussion in the Lawrence case, for example, but it is one of the factors that is looked at on the other side of the, uh, uh, the balance. Well, do you see any erosion of precedent as to Roe? Well, again, I think I should stay away from discussions of particular issues that are likely to come before the court again. And in the area of abortion, uh, there are cases on the court's docket, of course. It is an issue that does come before the court. So while I'm happy to talk about stare decisis and uh, the importance of precedent, um, I don't think I should get into the application of those principles in a particular area. Well, Judge Roberts, I don't know that we're dealing with any specific issue. If uh, when you mention, and you brought the term up, uh, erosion of precedent, whether you see that as a factor in the application of stare decisis or expectations, uh, for example, on the citation I quoted from Casey versus Planned Parenthood. Well, in, in the particular case of Roe, obviously you had the Casey decision in 90, 92 or 93. 92. 92, uh, in which they went through the various factors on stare decisis and reaffirmed the, the central holding in Roe while revisiting the trimester framework and the um, substituting the undue burden analysis for the strict scrutiny. So as of 92, you had a reaffirmation of the central holding in Roe. That's, that decision, that application of the principles of stare decisis is, of course, itself a precedent that would be entitled to respect under those principles. 
the joint opinion then goes on after the statement as to sexual activity uh, to come to the core issue about women being able to plan their lives. Quote, the joint opinion says, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. Uh, do you agree with that statement, uh, Judge Roberts? Well, yes, Senator, as a general proposition, but I do feel compelled to uh, point out that I should not, based on the precedent of prior nominees, uh, agree or disagree with particular decisions, um, and uh, I'm reluctant to do that. That's one of the areas where I think the prior nominees have drawn the line when it comes to do you agree with this case or do you agree with that case? And uh, that's, that's uh, something that I'm going to have to draw the line in the same well, place. Well, I'm not uh, going to ask you whether you're going to vote to overrule or, or sustain it, but we're talking here about uh, uh, the jurisprudence of the court uh, and their reasoning. Let me come to uh, another key uh, phase of uh, Casey, where the joint opinion says a, quote, terrible price would be paid for overruling Roe. It would seriously weaken the court's capacity to exercise the judicial power and to function as the Supreme Court of the nation dedicated to the rule of law. Now, this moves, this moves away from, uh, from uh, the specific holding and goes to a much broader jurisprudential uh, point, uh, really raising the issue of whether there would be uh, uh, a recognition of the court's authority. And in a similar line, uh, the court uh, said this, that to overrule Roe would be, quote, a surrender to political pressure, and added, quote, to overrule under fire would subvert the court's legitimacy, close quote. So in, the, in these statements on, on Casey, you're really going beyond the holding. You're going to the legitimacy and authority uh, of the court. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I do think the considerations about uh, the court's legitimacy uh, are critically important. Uh, in other cases, um, I'm thinking of um, you know, Payne versus Tennessee, for example. Uh, the court has focused on extensive disagreement as a grounds in favor of reconsideration. In Casey, uh, the court looked at the uh, disagreement as a factor in favor of reaffirming uh, the decision. So it's a factor that is played different ways in different precedents of the court. Um, I do think that it is a jolt to the legal system when you overrule a precedent. Uh, precedent plays an important role in promoting stability and even-handedness. It is not enough, and the court has emphasized this on several occasions, it is not enough that you may think the prior decision was wrongly decided. Uh, that really doesn't answer the question, it just poses the question. And you do look at these other factors, like settled expectations, like the legitimacy of the court, uh, like whether a particular precedent is workable or not, uh, whether a precedent has been eroded by subsequent developments, all of those factors go into the determination of whether to revisit a precedent under the principles of stare decisis. A jolt to the legal system, a movement against stability. One of the uh, Roberts if, doctrines. If, if, a, if a, a overruling of a prior precedent is a jolt to the legal system, it is inconsistent with principles of stability. On One, the, go ahead. I was just going to say the principles of stare decisis recognize that there are situations when that's a price that has to be paid. Obviously, Brown versus Board of Education is a leading example, overruling Plessy versus Ferguson. The uh, West Coast Hotel case overruling the Lochner era uh, decisions. Um, those, those were, uh, to a certain extent, jolts to the legal system, and the arguments against them had a lot to do with stability and predictability. But the other arguments, that intervening precedents had eroded the authority of those cases, uh, that those precedents that, they were, that were overruled had proved unworkable, uh, carried the day in those cases. One final citation from the joint opinion in Roe. Quote, after nearly 20 years of litigation in Roe's wake, we are satisfied that the immediate question is not the soundness of Roe's resolution of the issue, but the precedential force that must be accorded uh, to its holding. Uh, do you think uh, 
the court, the joint opinion is correct in elevating precedential force even above the specific holding of the case? That, that is the general approach when you're considering stare decisis. It's the, the notion that um, it's not enough that you might think that the precedent is flawed, that there are other considerations that enter into the calculus uh, that have to be taken into account. Um, uh, the values of respect for precedent, even-handedness, predictability, stability, the considerations on the other side, whether a precedent you think may be flawed is workable or not workable, whether it's been eroded. Uh, so to the extent that the statement is making the basic point that it's not enough that you might think the precedent is flawed to justify revisiting it, I do agree with that. And that was a portion of what Chief Justice Roberts had to say about abortion and the law during his 2005 confirmation hearing. Next up, President Obama's 2009 nominee, Sonia Sotomayor. Here's some of what she had to say about the issue. The court's decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey reaffirmed the core holding of Roe. That is the precedent of the court and settled in terms of the holding of the court. Do you agree with Justices of Souter, O'Connor, and Kennedy in their opinion in Casey, which reaffirmed the core holding in Roe? As I said, I, Casey reaffirmed the holding in Roe. That is the Supreme Court's settled interpretation of what the core holding is and its reaffirmance of it. All right. So let me ask you, in a difficult area of the law, a question. The Supreme Court has decided on more than seven occasions that the law cannot put a woman's health at risk. It said it in Roe in 73, in Danforth in 76, in Planned Parenthood in 83, in Thornburg in 86, in Casey in 92, in Carhart in 2000, and in Iote in 2006. With both Justices Roberts and Alito on the court, however, this rule seems to have changed because in 2007, in Carhart II, the court essentially removed this basic constitutional right from women. Now, here's my question. When there are multiple precedents and a question arises, are all the previous decisions discarded, or should the court re-examine all the cases on point? It's somewhat difficult to answer that I question know. because before the court in any one case is this particular factual situation. And so how the court's precedents <coughs> apply to that unique factual situation because often what comes before the court is something that's different than its prior decision. Not always, um, but often. In the Carhartt case, um, the court looked to its precedents, and as I understood that case, it was uh, deciding a different question, which was whether there were other um, means, safer means, and equally effective means for a woman to exercise her right than the procedure at issue in that case. That was, I don't believe, a rejection of its prior precedents. Its prior precedents are still the precedents of the court. The health and welfare of a woman must be must be a compelling consideration. So you believe that the health of the woman still exists? It is a as a part. Uh, you mentioned many cases. It has been a part of the court's jurisprudence and a part of its precedents. Those precedents must be given deference in any situation that arises before the court. And that was Justice Sonia Sotomayor responding to questions about Roe v. Wade during her 2009 confirmation hearing in the Senate. A reminder that all confirmation hearings in their entirety are available to watch online at cspan.org.
Clarence Thomas is the longest-serving justice on the court today. Nominated by President George H.W. Bush, Justice Thomas began serving in 1991. His nomination process, of course, was one of the most contentious and closely followed in history. The issue of abortion and the law came up. Here's Justice Thomas. And I think we all feel strongly in this country about the, our privacy. I do. I believe the Constitution protects the right to privacy. And I have no reason or agenda to prejudge the issue or to predispose to rule one way or the other on the issue of abortion, which is a difficult issue. I'm not asking you to prejudge it. Just as you can respond, and I will get into some of the questions to which you responded yesterday, both from Senators Thurman Hatch and Biden about matters that might come before the court, you certainly can express an opinion as to whether or not you believe that a woman has a right to choose to terminate her pregnancy without indicating how you expect to vote in any particular case, and I'm asking you to do that. Senator, I think that to do that would seriously compromise my ability to sit on a case of that importance and that uh, involving that important issue. Let us proceed. Judge Thomas, in 1990, I chaired a committee hearing on the Freedom of Choice Act, where we heard from women who were maimed by back alley abortionists. Prior to the Roe decision, only wealthy women could be sure of having access to safe abortions. Poor, middle class women were forced to unsafe back alleys if they needed an abortion. It was a very heart rending hearing. Frankly, I'm terrified that if we turn the clock back on legal abortion services, women will once again be forced to resort to brutal and illegal abortions. The kinds of abortions were coat hangers substitute for surgical instruments. The consequences of Roe's demise are so horrifying to me and the millions of American women and men that I want to ask you once again, appealing to your sense of compassion, to whether or not you believe the Constitution protects a woman's right to abortion. Senator, the prospect, and I guess as a, as a kid, we heard the hushed whispers about illegal abortions and um, individuals performing them in less than safe environments but they were whispers. It would, of course, if a woman is subjected to the agony of an environment like that, on a personal level, certainly, I am very, very pained by that. I think any of us would be. I wouldn't want to see people uh, subjected to uh, torture of that nature. But I think it's important to me, though, on the issue the, the question that you asked me, as, as difficult as it is for me to anticipate or to want to see that kind of uh, illegal activity, I think it would, it would undermine my ability to sit on an impartial way on an important case like that. I have some difficulty with that, Judge Thomas, and I'm frank to tell you, because yesterday uh, you responded when Senator Biden asked you if you supported the right to privacy validated against in Moore v. the city of East Cleveland by agreeing that the court's rulings supported the notion of family as one of the most private relationships we have in our country. That was one matter that might come before the court. You also responded when Senator Thurman asked you whether following the court's ruling in Payne v. Tennessee families victimized by violence should be allowed to participate in criminal cases. You went on to respond by indicating that the court had recently considered that matter, and you expressed concern that such participation could undermine the validity of the process. You also responded to Senator Thurman's questions about the validity of placing limits on appeals in death penalty cases the fairness of the sentencing guidelines, which was another one of his questions. 
and the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule, which was another one of his questions. And finally, you responded when Senator Hatch asked whether you might rely on substantive due process arguments to strike down social pro problems, programs such as OSHA, food safety laws, child care legislation, and the like, by telling him that, quote, the court determined correctly that it was the role of the Congress to make complex decisions about health and safety and work standards, end of quote. Now, all of those issues could come before the court again, just as the Roe v. Wade matter might come before the court again. So my question about whether the Constitution protects a woman's right to choose is frankly not one bit different from the types of questions that you willingly answered yesterday from other members of this committee. And that's a look at what the current nine justices on the Supreme Court had to say about abortion and the law. A reminder that all Supreme Court nomination hearings in their entirety are available to watch online anytime at cspan.org. Vanderbilt University professor Michael Eric Dyson discussed his book, Energy